to ask all of you to stand, if you would, right now and open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, and we're going to read again. I think we read this some, some months ago, but we're going to read it again. But uh, Revelation chapter 3, turn there, uh, verses 7 to 13. And we are looking again, as you guys well know, that we're, we've taken on this series, this discipleship series. And uh, this is the third week that we're talking about the church. We've been talking about many topics, uh, but this is the uh, third week in talking about this topic of the church. Are you ready? Oh, by the way, we're reading the New King James Version. I have to remind you that first service didn't go very well. <laughs> if you don't have the New King James, don't read along. You can hum, you can whatever, but don't read some other version. It sounds confusing. Revelation 3.17. And to the angel of the church at Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Awesome. Verse 11, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. Verse 13, and I'll end with this. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we pray, Lord, that today as a church family gather together, Lord, that you would change us, touch us, mold us, shape us, enlighten us, Lord, challenge us. We know from your Bible it says that we will be uplifted and at the same time we'll be convicted There'll be things about your spirit working in our lives. We'll be exhorted and we'll be rebuked if your word has its way with us. So, Lord, we do want to say this morning, we do want to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. And while we're at it, Father, I want to ask you, Lord, that you would make us like this church here in, of Philadelphia. God, that you'd make us a church that is ready and obedient that has a little bit of strength and power to do your will, that you would open doors and that you would close doors according to your sovereign will. And Father, that we'd be a people who would be faithful to do whatever it is you bring to our ability to do. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And as we are looking at this gathering together regarding the church, we've been studying, as I said, these last three weeks. And in these last few weeks together, we've looked at what is the church. And in talking about that, we've had four things that we now have under our belt regarding a church. And it's good stuff to know. If you attend a church, maybe you're searching for a church, uh, praying about a church. I met a, a wonderful couple, by the way, last Wednesday night. Uh, they live in Seattle. They drove down to San Diego for vacation, and they drove up Wednesday night for the service, and then they drove back to San Diego after the service. Uh, so what, what, what was your excuse for not being here? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Anyway, um, but uh, the reason why is because they, they tune in. They, they listen. They watch the services uh, up in Seattle. And they, they said, we're part of this church. And that's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, but whatever church you attend, uh, know this, that as we've been looking at the things that make a New Testament church happen... Uh, we graduate today to a new question, but last time we answered the first question, which was, what is the church? And we saw that it is a community that is Christ-centered. 
You can get together for any reason, and it doesn't make it a church. You can have a cross on the top of your building. It doesn't make it a church. Is it a Christ-centered community of believers where Jesus is the topic of conversation, where the Word of God is the guideline to live in life, and that the Holy Spirit in that community of believers is the very propellant, the accelerant that makes that church a community? And then we saw that it's a family, that the church of God, the Bible tells us, God tells us, he being our father, that we are in the family of God. And it's a Christ-centered family, that by the Holy Spirit, we who are Christ belong to this family, whereby we cry out to God, Abba, Father. And the Bible also taught us last time that being a family, the scripture says that his spirit, that is Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are, in fact, children of God. And that's a very comforting promise, that God's Holy Spirit will speak to you and walk with you and lead you and guide you day by day in your Christian existence. That's how we know we're believers, because he's always speaking to us and leading us. And we saw that that reality leads to a Christ-centered manifestation of faith, that a church is not something that just happens for an hour or two on a Sunday, but it's something where the church comes and gets refilled on a Sunday or a Wednesday or whenever, and then goes back out and lives out their faith as a church community, as a church family, in faith. It's very exciting when a church is being operated uh, in that area of faith because as the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Listen, this is so, it's so simple, comforting, uh, but we often miss this. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So whenever you listen to uh, teaching, read the Bible on your own, gather together for a service, now you won't feel anything physically, but spiritually you are growing, your faith is expanding when that happens. And uh, I have a way of, of viewing death personally. I think that when a Christian dies, the reason why it's time for them to die is that the inside of them outgrows the outside of them. That when a Christian is growing, there comes a point in time where it's time to weigh anchor and go to heaven. And I like that view. If you have some other view that uh, disagrees with mine, don't tell me. Because I like living in my little bubble. I like that. That the day that I die is the day that my spirit has grown enough to outgrow the use of my body. And I graduate. I think a Christian, when a Christian dies, a Christian graduates into the presence of God. And uh, all of that growth comes by faith. That's why we as believers, we want to be in the Word of God more and more all the time because our faith increases. And how do we know that when our faith increases that that's what's really happening? Well, one of the things is that we'll begin to venture out and live a more, and I mean this in a good way, a more reckless life for God. We won't be so careful. We will do what Jesus talked about, and that is we will give up our lives that we might present our lives to him. And only in doing that do we really experience what I would say is a dynamic or radical Christian life. And this is where we ended last time. It's hard for us to handle, but the Bible teaches us, those of us who are believers, that we are in fact Christ-centered gathering of people called saints by God. God has called us. I'm so glad that God's the one who calls us saints, right? Because that's his theology. But for all of us who follow Christ, he has declared us to be saints. And the beauty of that, we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb of God, our sacrifice Christ, our sacrifice Jesus. For us, we've been cleansed, we've been washed, we are now renewed and made brand new with him, and uh, we now walk in newness of life. So here we go. We now ask this question, why the church? If God in his desire is to get the gospel out to the ends of the earth, that the preaching of the gospel is so vitally important and it should be the very foundational act of the church to get the good news. So watch, Jesus buys, allow me to put it this way, he buys the gospel himself on the cross with his own blood. To empower it, he's resurrected from the dead on Sunday morning. 2,000 years ago. That message is so transforming and so powerful. It's the greatest message that's ever been told that ever will be told. That it has the absolute power to transform a person's life, the way they think, who they are. 
then why would God leave that duty to the church? I'm kind of surprised by that. Why would God take the greatest news ever and give it to the church to do? I have that question to ask him. I would have given that job to angels. I would have given that job to, to somebody more proficient. But according to the Bible, God has given you and I the ability and the, and the hope and the joy and the responsibility to tell the world the greatest news ever. And I find that incredibly remarkable. And it starts this way. Jesus said, for example, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, the Bible says, then he said to them, that is the disciples, those that he was gathering, he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The ministry of Jesus and the creation of the church starts with him calling out, we know from our Bibles, 12 people, 12 men, and it all started by him saying, come and follow me. And those men got up and they followed Christ at whatever they were doing. Some were fishermen, some were tax collectors, uh, some uh, others involved in other things, Judas involved in other things, yet God called him. That's amazing, right? Jesus, the pastor of a church of only 12 people, and one of them was the devil. That's amazing. But he called them to come and follow me. And then all that time of establishing the church, right before Jesus leaves, and goes back to heaven. In Matthew 28, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And this is his word to those 12. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the amazing bookends of the birth of the church. He calls a few, he trains them, he equips them, and then he commissions them to the end of the earth, and then we learned last week that on the day of Pentecost, he empowered them by his Holy Spirit, and the rest is history. For 21 centuries, the gospel goes out around the world. The church is that vehicle. Why the church? Because God gets all the glory, she's been given a task that's impossible, and yet God, rather than having angels do it, he picked you. He picked you to do it. For this reason, every one of us who would say today we're Christians, God has in your life a testimony. Whatever it may be, you have your word, you have your message, how God touched you in this life. And rather than deploying angels, God deploys you. You are the disciples. 21 centuries ago, it was those guys. 21 centuries now, it's you. And you can't put that off on somebody else. You can't say, well, pastor, I'm shy. Listen, you may be shy, but get over it. Well, I don't like to talk to people. That's fine. Listen, just get over it. And I mean it this way, lovingly. I'm kind of giving you a little kick, but with a big heart. We all have our excuses. But has God touched your life? Has the message of the gospel come to you? And has it transformed your life? And you're a member, you're in the body of Christ? Then Jesus says to you today, go therefore into all the world. He said, well, how am I going to go into all the world? Well, that's the amazing thing about the age in which you and I live in right now. You not only have the opportunity to go to your neighbor next door, but you and I together have the opportunity to go to the ends of the earth. I mean that literally. This last week, I had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Ed Heinsen, a man I love there at Liberty University. And Dr. Ed had made uh, mention over the fact that uh, our radio program, Real Radio, was heard on stations all across America they hear it there in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, he said, you know, millions of people listen to Christian radio across the nation every day. And then I thought about Sirius XM Radio, where those fine people there asked us to join uh, their station some two years ago. And Sirius XM Radio has a paid membership subscription nationwide of 26 million people are subscribed every day to that station. And uh, the opportunity, and he said, Heinzen said, Jack, today, with just one sermon aired on the radio across America, you can reach more people in one day than the Apostle Paul did in his lifetime. And I had to think about that for a moment, because my first thought was, that's impossible. And then I thought, wait a minute, that's exactly how the gospel works. Paul traveled by boat, traveled by donkey, traveled on foot. It took him a lifetime to get from Jerusalem over all the way over to areas of Europe and sometimes speaking to a hundred, sometimes a thousand, sometimes ten. 
But in one moment of time, with radio going around the world and satellite beaming the gospel, and that's something that all of us are involved in. A moment ago, you saw how many people you're reaching in Africa with the gospel in a Muslim nation. How does that happen? Because the gospel has transformed your life. And you and I being members of this work of God, this church that he's put together, what is it? It's none other than an amazing thing, mark it down if you would, that the church is God's ministry of grace to this world. If grace is going to get out beyond these walls, it's going to happen every moment that you're deployed out of this place, you're going to carry the grace of God. Now look, according to the Bible, the Bible tells us, and listen carefully, that when Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God and he had his disciples and he instructed them, he told them, listen, he told them, go now, not to the Gentiles, Don't go to them. What did he say to do? He said, first go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go to my people, Israel. I've come to them first, and you go and spread the good news. And as they went preaching, the Bible tells us that people came to believe in Christ. But there's a very key thing that we know about Israel as a nation. As a nation and its national leaders, they rejected Christ. The Bible tells us they rejected Christ because the religious order, the the Pharisees and the scribes, in their arrogance and in their envy, rejected Jesus. The Old Testament prophets said that they would do that. They would reject him. And Paul the Apostle comes along, and Peter comes along in the book of Acts, and they're preaching to the house of Israel, and Israel says, we don't want to hear this. And there's a great statement that you and I are all thankful for. The disciples said, you then, judging yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we now turn and preach to the Gentiles. And in that moment, the gospel was born out to the ends of the earth. And you and I are here today as predominantly Gentiles believing in the gospel. And God uses the church. Why the church? Because when you get saved and you share with somebody else, listen, when you get saved and you share with somebody else what Christ has done for you, there's a power to that. Maybe you've come out of prostitution. I told you a couple weeks ago, I met someone who has come out of prostitution, heard about this church, came out and, well, came and visited, heard the gospel, gave her life to Christ, and now is involved in ministry. How does that happen? Because someone was able to relate to her and speak to her and give her hope. On and on it goes, connecting, touching, It may be a corporate office environment and uh, someone shares, oh, this or that about God and something happens and God begins to work. It would never work with an angel. It would never work with somebody else. It works with you. God has touched your life. The fact of the message is that you are a modern day disciple and I'd like to consider you a modern day apostle in the sense that you go out and speak to people, but it's all about a ministry of grace. Now listen to what this means. God's grace has changed your life. God's grace has changed my life. Very, very beautifully, God has changed our lives. And I think about this and I wrote it down. That by God's grace, by his power, God has changed. We've, we, in this church, we've watched him change people's lives in Russia, in Germany, and China, In other parts of the world, we've watched God change people's lives in California. It's possible right here in California, even in Hollywood. You can reach out with the gospel. And here's the amazing thing about the ministry of God's grace out of your life. See, because the human temptation uh, in religiosity is this, is to be a Christian and to beat somebody up with uh, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And I understand that regarding the law, there's... There's a place for that, but you're to never beat anybody up with it. Are you hearing me? Listen, this is very important. Let's not miss this. When you and I talk to other people about the grace of God, we need to realize that the church in America uh, has not done, in my opinion, not a very good uh, PR campaign for God's grace. Many people today think like this in church. Well, you know, I'm a dope. I'm a doper. I'm a drunk. I sleep with my boyfriend, but God's grace is awesome. What do you mean? 
I think if I'm hearing you right, you're saying I can keep sleeping with my boyfriend, I can keep doing drugs, I can keep being a drunk, and I'll get to heaven by default because of God's grace. And if you think that's true, you have lied to yourself, you have violated all that the Bible says. In fact, you are what is called an antinomian. It means that you, as long as you live your life the way you want to, and then ask God to forgive you, and then you go right back to doing it, the Bible declares that you, in fact, do not know God. You're, you may be very religious in your activity, but it is a Christless, crossless, powerless religion that you've created. That's not the grace of God. People will say, oh, you Christians, your, your grace of God is cheap. It's not cheap. It's the most expensive thing in the universe. It costs God everything. It costs him the price of his son at the cross. But it's this grace that transforms us. God's grace, if you've ever wondered, has God's grace taken hold of my life? Is that your question? Well, here's the answer. God's grace gives you the power to get up and out of those things that you know offend Christ. God's grace gets you the power to break away from those things. This is very important. Well, you know, I just think a little bit of pornography is okay. You know, a little bit keeps our marriage spicy. That's idolatry. And it's prevalent today. You're in bondage. God's grace wants to set you free from that. Well, you know what? I, you know, I don't tithe, but I, I always tell God that if I, just, if, I win, if I win there in Vegas or scratch the numbers there at the lotto thing, that if I ever win, God and I have got a deal, and I'll give him some money if I win. Idolatry. You can't do that. You're deceiving yourself. God's grace is not weak so that his people stumble through life. God's grace is powerful so that it delivers us from the bondage of life. And God turns around and he uses you and I to tell other people that you don't have to be like this. So listen, last service, a man came up to me, a man came up to me, he was was terrified. It was actually awesome. Very distinguished, handsome man. Uh, You could tell he was well-established. He came up and uh, he said hello to me and then his bottom lip began shaking. And then the lower part of his eyes began to fill up with tears. And I said, obviously something's wrong. He said, I don't think I'm a Christian after this sermon. I need Jesus now in my life. I've just gone all along in this anemic thing, assuming I'm a believer, but I'm powerless in this life. And everything that you mentioned this morning, pastor, is controlling my life. God wants to set that man free. We prayed together. And uh, listen, he seems as though he's tired and sick of it. And that's good. The ministry of grace is powerful. And God wants to liberate us by it. The Bible tells us with Noah. The first time grace is used in the Bible is the life of Noah. In Genesis 6, verse 8, the Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The word grace is both in the Hebrew and in the Greek. It's the same meaning. Divine. It's the divine stooping down to us. It's the coming down to bestow favor to pick us out and to bless us, to target us. I like that word, to target us with his unmerited favor. God wants to bestow upon us grace. You might think, well, Jack, you know, Noah was a good boat builder. That's why God picked him. Noah Noah had never built a boat in his life. And if he did, maybe he had a popsicle sticks. It was never a big one. And God said, no, I want you. God did that in his life. God called him out of all the generations of that sin-filled culture. And I would love, someday I'm going to meet, and you are too, we're going to meet Noah. By the way, my grandson got a really cool shirt. It says, uh, uh, you want to build a boat? I know a guy. (laughs) It's very cute, you know. I love being around people who know something about the grace of God that it costs God everything, but it's precious to us every day. And I wrote down two things, two statements that I've noticed in life. The most loving people I know are those who have been greatly loved. I'll explain it in a moment. The most loving people I know are those who have been greatly loved. Secondly, the most forgiving people I know are those who have been greatly forgiven. And I want you to think about that for a moment. There are people who are self-righteous, very impressed with themselves. They're good. They're okay. They're fine. You're not going to get much grace from them. You might get a lot of information from them. They might tell you how to live your life. 
but they can't give you the grace that actually helps you to get up and get going. There's no encouragement with them. But you meet or find somebody who knows about the grace of God, and when they talk to you, it gives you encouragement. It'll boost you up because they know what cost God everything in the life of his son afforded to them this grace and that transform of power they can turn and tell you, looking you right in the eyes with conviction and say, I know what it's like to be where you're at and I got good news for you, buddy. God is about to pick you up and lead you out of that pit. Let's go. They know and then love. If you've been greatly loved, if you understand that God's grace lavished upon you and God loving on you, bringing you into the family and giving you the ministry to exercise his grace, love, what does the Bible say? Covers a multitude of sins. You'll love other people. God is giving you the ministry of his grace. It's an awesome thing to keep in mind. But listen, when we talk about God's grace... We'll wrap this part up by saying this. We need to be careful in our modern age to stop using grace almost as a conversational piece. And I mean it like this. We can wrongly represent grace by saying to somebody, hi, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Jesus died on the cross, okay? And he rose again from the dead, okay? Would you like to accept Christ? Uh, sure. Did you know that you just completely, possibly ruined that person forever? You just gave them an inoculation against the true gospel if they were to ever hear it. What I just gave you was not the true gospel. Yes, it is true. Jesus died on the cross. Yes, it's true. He rose again from the dead. Why? Why did he die on the cross? Why was he resurrected from the dead? You say, well, John 3, 16. Now, I don't know how many of you in here are old enough or as old as I am, but I remember growing up back in those days when you'd watch an NFL football game, you'd get one verse every game. In fact, you'd get that verse every time somebody made a touchdown. You know what I'm talking about? Every time some team made a touchdown or kicked a field goal, right? I don't know how they did it, but somewhere in every stadium all across America, every Sunday, there would be some guy with a John 3.16 sign <laughs> between the field goal uprights when the guy would kick the ball. Does anyone, is anyone old enough to remember that? Raise your hand. Uh, several of us, a few of us. It's good to know we have a church of either liars or a lot of young people. <laughs> but um, you got John 3.16, and then, you know, after all those decades of that, somebody complained, and you can't take a John 3.16 sign now into an NFL game. Who cares anyway, right, about the NFL? If they can't stand when the national anthem is, uh, I, they're not going to get a, forget them. Forget them. Just go to a college game instead. But anyway, I'm moving on. That's not the topic. Um, <laughs> John 3, oh, John 3, 16, John 3, 16. Listen, have you forgotten, and we need to be reminded as a church that all nestled around John 3, 16 are other verses. Now I'm going to give some of them to you right now. John 3, 16 is wonderful, and the grace of God is wonderful. But listen, you can't lead somebody to Christ who doesn't see their great need for Christ. They've got to see the need before they could ever get saved. They've got to know they're lost, and they need the ministry of God's grace before they can ever be rescued. And I'm afraid we are inoculating people against the truth. John 3, 14 says, As Moses was lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Number one, Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to be crucified. Verse 15. That whoever believes, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In other words, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to perish. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only glorified or begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So that means we need saving. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe, does not trust, does not rely upon, does not have faith in him is condemned already 
because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, but men love darkness, listen, rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not want to come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. That's the gospel. The Bible says there's a light and there's a darkness. And there's a world in the darkness that's perishing. Listen, friends and family, members, you and I know, co-workers, they're going to hell. They're going to hell and they're lost. They don't want anything to do with you. You're Jesus, the gospel, they're blind. They're, they're bound by sin. The Bible says that they're blinded by the God of this world. Satan has blinded them with all of their passions and all of their desires. Just like you and I once were blinded like that. And then the Bible says there's those who are in the light. The believer. And here's the difference. Conversion. Born again. Difference. We were just like them once, remember. That's why we ought to love them. That's why we ought to reach out to them. But listen, because we've been changed, God has radically changed us, and now we are different people. We walk in the light. The Bible makes it very clear that what has happened to us is that the grace of God has transformed our lives. It is absolutely the power of God. And to think that heaven is going to be a place filled with sinners who have been redeemed by God's grace is a remarkable thing. He's put a new nature in us. And that's how we know that we are now ministers of his grace. The second thing we see is that the church, why the church, why would God want to use the church is the fact that the church is God's representative power in the world today. God wants to display his power through the church. Now, if you're like me, you might say, yeah, that sounds good on paper, but I don't see a very powerful church in the earth much at all. So let me ask you this. What would a powerful church look like to you? If you could define or describe a powerful church, what does that look like to you? You've got to stop and think about that for a moment. Because it is God's will that the church be powerful and represent his power on earth. But does that mean that we build some big cathedral? Is that the power? What about, does it mean that we uh, take over the nation and declare it Christian? Is that the power? You'd have to define that. We know it's God's will that the church be the representative power of God on earth. But how that power is displayed is altogether different. The church is to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, which influences the culture. And I'm going to go somewhere with this. Listen carefully. When we talk about the representative power, you've got to go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. This is awesome. I love this. It says there, and remember, this is the first century church. The church has just gotten born. There's probably hundreds, maybe, of believers Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Peter was preaching. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to the church. Can you imagine that? And they continued. First of all, before I read verse 42, hundreds of believers, Peter stands up and he preaches. And you can read that sermon. It's in Acts chapter 2. He preached a message that took maybe a minute or two. This is power. Listen, can you imagine? Can you imagine holding a crusade? Can you imagine Greg Laurie or Billy Graham holding a crusade? 50,000 people show up. Greg Laurie or Billy Graham speaks for two minutes and thousands of people come forward. That's the power of God. Peter speaks and look what happens with verse 42. It says, and they continued steadfast. Look, number one, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Number two, they fellowshiped. Number three, they broke bread together. Number four, they prayed. And verse 43 is the result. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done. What happened? Listen, Peter delivered the word of God. The Holy Spirit was present to a crowd of unbelievers. And in one day, a church of hundred in one day, in a few minutes, a church becomes a mega church. 3,000 souls. You say, well, I like a little church. I understand that. I appreciate that. I like a little church. Little churches are sweet. But if you read the Bible, 
or if you go to a church where the word of God is lifted up, Christ is exalted, and the power of God is present, guess what's going to happen? Souls are going to be added to that church. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Here's the deal. Say, I'm, this church is too big for me. I'm leaving. Okay, well, where are you going to go? We're going to go to a church that teaches the word of God. The Holy Spirit is empowered. Christ is exalted. Okay, awesome. Quick, go. Go there, quick. Hang on to your seat, though, because it's going to grow quick. It's going to grow. I know we want to have a little church and just, oh, we got it now. It's just 10 of us. Let's keep it together. If the word of God is going out, if the Holy Spirit is allowed to move in his power, it's going to be a ministry of God's grace. It's going to grow. So what happens. God's not interested in our comfort. He's interested in getting as many people possible to heaven. And then the Bible said there in verse 43 of Acts 2 that great fear came upon the people. Now, that's not the fear of, oh, no, we're terrified. When I was a little guy, I would get words confused. I still do as an old guy. But uh, I used to, when I was really terrified, I, you know, there's the word afraid and scared. And I'd always mix those up. So I was always a scared. <laughs> I'm a scared of that. I'm a scared of that. I'm a scared now. If it was a big deal, I'm a scared. That's not what that word means, that they're all a scared when they feared God. Oh, no. This is the key. This is the key to all of our lives as a church being effective in ministry. This is both in your home and beyond. They feared the Lord. It means to be in reverential awe of God. I love that. Somebody could march up and say, Pastor, I want you to change my life. Put me in handcuffs. Uh, sew my mouth shut. Uh, blind my eyes. Just make, I want to be holy. I want to be pure. And I, uh, lock me in a box. Make me a monk. We're not going to do that. You can't do that. It won't work. You know what works? To be in reverential awe of God. To fear the Lord, the Bible says, is, is to depart from evil. The reason why the first century church exploded is because the people saw the power of God moving. It was awesome, beautiful. And what was the crowning effect of the power of God moving? Oh, it's the goosebumps I felt. It was the goosebumps. Oh, and then they sang that song and I felt so good inside. And it, it was none of that junk. The power of God moving were transformed lives. And people went all around town saying, come here, you need to bring your life over here. God's going to change your life. Everybody wants a life change. And God changes your life. God's the one that does it. And so that power, that transforming power in people's lives is attractive. It's beautiful. And it's a ministry of God's grace. And it's the ministry of God's grace and it's, the awesome and glorious power, the fact that God in his grace and in his power transforms our lives and people see the difference. Listen to this. This is great, great, in my opinion, examples of God's power. We want to talk about the reality of God's power. How do I know the reality of God's power in my life as a believer? Now, we're just all common, normal, we would say, believers, if there's such a thing. But here we are, children of God, going to heaven. Until then, God's got a job for us. What is the reality of that power in our lives? Well, the Bible tells us, Micah, great verse, I love this verse. Micah tells us in Micah chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, he speaks about the calamity of the false prophets and the false uh, believers and all. But in verse 8, he says, I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. Did you know that God wants to give each and every one of us his power to live why the church? Because the church is the greatest living example on earth of God having take, taken someone out of the world and empowering them by his spirit. And now we go out into that world, as we've been talking about these last few weeks, and people know that there's a difference in our lives. It's an amazing thing. But God wants to do that, and God does that in our lives. The second thing is this, is that the reality leads to the result if God's at work in your life, if you pray today, Lord, like Micah, I want the power of God in my life. By the way, you should do that all the time. The next thing is, what about the result? What's going to be the result of God's power in my life? And I love what my...
pastor, Chuck Smith, who's now in heaven, used to say, now listen to this. This is a great word of wisdom. When you talk about power and results, Chuck Smith said, God is not interested in how high you can jump in a church service. He's interested in how straight you walk after you land. And that's a good word. How can you and I, who are prone to sin, prone to doing the wrong thing, walk right? And the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, the result of this power. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say <laughs> rejoice. Do you rejoice always? Do you? I don't. I wish I could tell you I do. Your pastor is always rejoicing. I don't. But I know this, that when the power of God has got a hold of me and the reality of that, there's certainly victory. There's certainly a time of great rejoicing. That verse goes on. That por portion of Scripture, Philippians 4, verse 5, says, Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Verse 6, Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Do you ever get anxious for anything? No, you don't? I do. We all get anxious. People get anxious all the time. It's one of the things that invade our human psyche. We have a tendency to worry about things, to fret, to be anxious, to be undone by these things. Listen, the power of God at work in our life because of God's word, the spirit, we invite him in, we're, we're the church, God, we're just mere humans, but you have redeemed us, you have saved us. Oh God, give me your power. And oh, by the way, Lord, I'm anxious. I'm worried about this thing. I'm concerned about it. It is absolutely a divine act of God that we be not anxious. It's impossible for us, but God will do that. And we'll take that anxiety and place it right with him. And listen, friends, that is often, sometimes it's not easy. We got to get on our knees or we've got to get on our bellies and lay out before him. We've got to cry out to God. We've got to keep doing it over and over again. But listen, if you're worried, if you're anxious about something, it's because you haven't given it to God. And you say, oh, I gave it to God. If you're still worried about it, you need to keep giving it to God. Anxiety. We don't need, listen, we're Christians. God is our father. Yeah, but I got cancer. God knows that. He knows exactly what he's doing with your life. Well, how come this? How come that? I don't know, but God's at work. Do you, here's the question, do you belong to him? If you belong to him, no matter what's going on in your life, God is in control of that thing. And you rest in him. If somebody says this, this is the deal, this is the issue, this is the thing, makes no sense to you, does it? How can this be? God's in control. I don't understand it. I'm to rest in this. God will, look, God will take the worst things that you can possibly imagine and turn them around. In my mind, I can't share with you in my mind what just came into my mind about the worst things that can happen. But I'll just simply tell you this. I wrote about it. It's in a book, but I, don't want to, I can't say it out loud publicly. You can read it. In fact, when I put in, we were putting in the book, the publisher said, I don't think we want to put this in the book. I said, that's got to go in the book. I would just say this. One of the worst things that could ever happen happened to me. And now, as a Christian, I look back and I thank God that it happened. How can that go on in your life? How can that go on in my life? Because what he does, he takes those things that you and I would say, it is the worst thing that could possibly be. And if you just give him the time, he will take that insurmountable thing that is causing you anxiety and he'll lift it so preciously right out of your hand and he'll take it and he'll say, Jack, I'm at work in this. Will you let me do it? Because every time I take it out of his hands, it slows down the process. You know that? Every time I grab it back from him, and I know every time I do, it's when I start worrying about it. I have to give it to him every day. The Bible goes on in Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. That's how you stay away from anxiety. Give it to him in prayer. Pray for others and be thankful. Let your request be made known to God. And here's the result. The peace, the calm of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard 
your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. God makes this promise. Listen, I don't often endorse tattoos, but you ought to get that tattooed on if you have a hard time remembering that one. That's a good one. God, you said, I'm starting to worry. I'm starting to fret. God, you told me that if I keep putting this out to you, you're going to take care of me and that your peace, your grace really will garrison, guard my heart and he'll do it. That's the reality of his power in the church, the result of his power in the church. And I like to say that there's the relevance of his power in the church, the relevance. And this is a growing opportunity for us. James says in James 1.26, James chapter 1, verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless or vain. Well, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I read my Bible. But the person's mouth is out of control. God says that person's deceived themselves. They're not for real. Verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans. <laughs> orphans. We don't hear much about orphans anymore, but I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, wouldn't orphans today be kids in the foster system? Right? You know, before I keep reading, there's a couple in this church. I'm going to be off. I don't have the number down. If somebody knows, let me know. But Lisa was telling me that over their lifetime, they have taken in over 50 children in their home as, a, as foster parents. And they view that as a mission field. They view that as a mission field. Their home is open to a needy child. And uh, I tell you what, I commend anyone who does that. And that's an awesome thing. And God will reward you. Babies sweet little babies being protected and taken into a loving Christian home. My heart breaks, though, when I meet young men, young women that are 12, 13, 14 years old that are going from one foster home to another or they're in the system of the state. It breaks my heart. And uh, just the other day, I was driving home, and I drive home. I, I got to go home every day right past Boys Republic. Are you, do you know about Boys Republic? Uh, that, that place had a very, well, he was a kid at the time, but he came out to be a very famous man and uh, had a horrible life. And uh, later in his latter days, uh, uh, came to Christ. But do you know who grew up there under their care as an orphan? Steve McQueen, right here in Chino Hills. And uh, came to Christ later on in life. But he, was a, he learned all of his bad boy stuff on the streets. And he was uh, an orphan there just down the street from us. Somebody reached out and somebody needs to reach out and God says those that are reaching out, look at how the kids you're loving in Mali, but it doesn't have to be Mali. What about the kids in downtown LA? The kids that are orphaned. We team up with other churches, uh, with FJM, Fred Jordan Mission, downtown Los Angeles, reaching out to children. Horrible things. Just because, by the way, a parent is not dead but, uh, but has a child, that, that child could still very much be orphaned because that parent is strung out on, on dope, strung out on drugs. And in a real way, that kid's orphaned. The relevance of the power of Christ con conforming your life to his image and not the world, the power of the relevance. A church that is alive with the Holy Spirit is reaching out. Thirdly, we see this. Why the church? Well, according to God, God made the church to be the guardian of his truth which always blows my mind. God's church is the guardian of his truth. How so? We repeat his truth. We proclaim his truth. We announce the truth. And um, we are indebted today to a man 2,000 years ago who I believe asked the ultimate question. I think it's the greatest question that's ever been asked. And that is Pilate. Pontius Pilate, Jesus appeared before Pilate on the eve of his crucifixion. And Pilate said, are you king of the Jews? I'm hearing this. People are saying you're, that you say you're a king. And Jesus said, you say rightly, for I am a king. For this cause I came into the world, or I was born. And for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. 
And Pilate asked the second question, which is the most important of all. He said, Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? That's an awesome question. That question is out today. What is truth? Go to your college campus. Ask your professor, what's truth? Don't, don't listen to their answer. Just ask them the question. <laughs> they don't know the answer. I don't care where you go. Ask people, what's truth? The Bible says Jesus said he's truth. The Bible says of itself that it is truth. The church doesn't guard God's truth in the sense that it has to be protected, that we are the custodians, the guardians of it, that we run with it. The Bible says that the word of God is a sword. We pull it out and we go with it. I love it. You think of the Bible like a sword and it just cuts through the darkness. It cuts through sin and wickedness and injustice and suffering and it brings hope and healing and rebuke and cleansing. God's word. As a church, do we love his word? As a people, do we love his word? It is so, uh, it's not something that we have to do. I will get up this morning, I gotta read the Bible. You get up this morning, you put the thing on. You get your Bible, you put it on speaking to a man in the courtyard after first service, and he said, I'm going backwards. I'm not going forward. And I go, let's do this. Right in the courtyard, I just did, now I don't recommend you do this at home, but I just did Bible roulette. I just turned somewhere in my Bible, okay? And I said, let's do this. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. Now that's talking about judgment, obviously. I would just say this out of that. I said, you would pray like this. Oh, God in heaven, give me victory. God, I'm standing on your word. Give me strength. Lord, whatever temptation comes from any angle or whatever pressure, oh, God, give me your answer. Make me strong, Lord. Make me valiant. And I'm standing on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And you know what? You can get up and you can go into your day clothed with the power of God's word. You may not feel a thing, but you'll see the power of it. Something will happen in your life that day and you will see the answer come right in front of you and you'll be shocked. You'll be blown away. That God gave you that answer in the morning, you put the armor on and you went out there and you saw God's truth and in living it out and in bearing witness of it, you're the guardian of God's truth. It's quite remarkable. God wants us to use his word. Now, for time's sake, I don't want to belabor this, but in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to the church at Laodicea. When you read the letters to the seven churches, the church at Laodicea is a church you don't want to be. It's not good. In Revelation 3, verse 15, Jesus said, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you. Some of you have the King James Version, which is very sweet and polite. It says spew. Doesn't that sound sweet almost? I will spew you out of my mouth. I don't know about you, but women spew and men vomit. <laughs> Either way, it's a violent word. Why would Jesus say such a thing? Verse 17, because you say I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing. But do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Can you imagine Jesus saying that to you, church? or to your family, or to you personally. This is horrible. Verse 20. Behold, he said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him. Come into him. I know that's often used wrongly, by the way, as an evangelistic verse. Did you know that? We use it in evangelism. To somebody who's not a Christian, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. That's okay, but that's not true. He's talking to a church of his. Can you imagine Jesus trying to get into a church of his? The church of Laodicea. And he says, I can't get in. Can somebody unlock the door? And he says, you're lukewarm. Laodicea, this is amazing. Uh, you're, I have no map. I have no pictures. This just pops into my head now. I just got to, you got to watch my hands. This is the illustration. Here it is. Laodicea was in a valley there in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. Colossae was a community that was at the base of a great mountain range. And in Colossae, ice cold melted snow waters would come out of the springs at Colossae. 
They were famous for ice-cold, wonderful, refreshing water. Everyone came to Colossae to fill up their barrels and their jugs and their skins with cool, refreshing water from those mountains. And Jesus said, I wish you were cold. I can be refreshed by you. If you were like Colossae, I could be refreshed if I visited you. Or across the valley and up on the other side of the range is Hierapolis. And Hierapolis, still to this day, it's a great tourist site. Beautiful therapeutic pools, hot water, mineral pools of great temperatures where people soak, have their bones refreshed or their bones comforted and soothed. And Jesus said, I wish you were hot. I wish you were hot and I could have comfort or I wish you were ice cold and I could be refreshed. Those two creeks flowed down into the valley and where those two creeks met was a place called Laodicea. There was a river upstream that was pure and clean. But when the water flowed out of those hot pools that were good to soak in but terrible to drink, and when it mixed with the ice good cold water in that river, it became tippid or lukewarm and polluted. And Jesus said, I'd rather have you be hot as a believer bringing therapy therapy everywhere you go or cool as a believer and you bring refreshment to anyone you go to but because you're lukewarm he says I'm going to puke you out of my mouth I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth a Christian who cannot function on either side they don't they're not, they're not therapy to anybody and they're not refreshing to anybody they just live for themselves they're mixed they've got the world in with the church they the what they are in the world uh, is not Christian and, and when they're in church uh, it's just a mess. And Jesus says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. The church ought not to be like that. The truth takes us from that. Jesus spoke to them the truth. He, he says to them, I'm telling you now, you need to buy from me these things that matter. You need to come back. And he warns them. The church more than ever needs to be so alive. And then we'll end with this. The church. Why the church? Because we are to be the image bearer of all, the church, us, we. The Bible says we are the light, which I find this amazing. Before the Bible ever says we are the light of the world, Jesus first says he is the light of the world. And then he turns to us and he tells us you are the light of the world. He says to the church, go and let your light so shine before the world. This is important to me. We are to be image bearers of all that God would have us to be as believers. We are not to be, listen, we are not to be, and we're not called to be as a church, creators or inventors. See, what do you mean? We're simply to be reflectors, church. We are not to reinvent church. We are not to create some new way of seeking God. We are to stick to those old paths, those strong paths that are proven of old, the truth of God. And we are to go forth in his power and simply reflecting all that he has given us. And I'm going to give you some verses as to why that's so important. Listen to this. John 16, verse 12. John 16, 12. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears... He will speak and he will tell you. Notice the progression of things to come. He will glorify me, says Jesus, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Church, listen. Jesus said that when he leaves, the Holy Spirit would come and say only to us what Jesus tells the Holy Spirit to say. But if you know your Bible, what did Jesus say about what the Father said to him to do? Jesus said, I only say that which the Father gave me to say. Jesus turns to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says only what Jesus says. What's the church supposed to say? Only what the Holy Spirit has to say. Do you see the progression? It's absolutely brilliant. We don't need to create the Bible. We don't need to change it. We don't need to do something different. We just need to give what the Holy Spirit gives. And I think therein is the key for us being a successful, strong Christian, Christian family, or church. Just do, just say what the Holy Spirit teaches. But that 
presupposes we know our Bible. I'm going to give you one more verse. Actually, I shouldn't say verse. I've never done this before. I'm going to give you Jack chapter 1, verse 13. <laughs> Jack 1, <laughs> Jack 1, 13. It's like, John's, it's like John, but listen, this is, this is Jack 1. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide the church, right, into all truth. For the church will not speak on its own authority. Someone say amen. That's good news. We don't need to make anything up. We don't have to conjure up power. We don't have any authority. We've been invited to partake of his authority. We have none of our own. But whatever the church hears, the church will speak. And the church will tell you things to come. For the church will glorify Christ. The church will take of what is his and declare it to the world. Is not that our mission? That's what we're to do. That's why it's the church. In a moment, you're going to get up and you're going to go back to your world. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, on mission, God's got a mission for you to fulfill. Because you've been transformed, your heart's desire is to share the good news to others. The power is all of God. It's a ministry of grace. His power transforms. And I leave you with this picture. In Psalm 119, verse 130, the Bible says, the teaching of your word gives light so, the, so even the simple can understand. I leave you with this picture. Whenever you and I sit down, or even now take in the word of God, as we ingest it, casual reading or study, the Bible tells us that we possess this truth in our earthen vessels in, inside of us, the spirit of who you are. When you and I take this word in and then we get up to go live it out, we are the light bearers of Christ to this world, that the word, that light's going to come out of us. And, and you may have remembered this before, but... It's pictured in Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah, the Bible tells us that as they were in battle, God tells Nehemiah, take these torches and put them in these pots and go out before the enemy. And when you are arrayed in battle and the enemy begins to advance and begins to attack, you shout the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And as that happens, break the pots. And when the pots were broken, all the light that was inside with those torches came flying out and it terrified the enemy and put them to running. As Christians, I want you to keep that in mind. Inside of you, if you are a believer in Christ, there's so much light inside of you that wants to get out. You and I need to be broken to our own agenda, broken to our own desires, broken to our own plan. And let God do with you what he wants to do. And he's got some exciting stuff that he wants to do with you. The greatest thing you can do today is say, Lord, just do it. In my life, just do it. I yield it, and I want you to just take me and break me and let me shine for you as a light bearer for Jesus. That's your marching orders for this week. I'd love to hear what happens in your life as you do that wherever you go. Father, we thank you for your awesome, dear, wonderful light and your truth. And Lord, we pray today Father, that any man or woman, boy or girl today, that doesn't know these things, that today these things are so foreign, that today these things are remote from their thinking, that perhaps they would even say, I don't know this. That right now, friend, wherever you're at, maybe you're evaluating your claim as a Christian. That nobody knows. You might say, few or no one knows I'm a believer. Or pastor, if I'm honest, my, my life is not powerful. I, I'm a victim of sin seemingly at every turn. I want to know Jesus. I want to have his power. But I'm just existing. Friend, today is the day that you need to meet Jesus once and for all. That today you surrender right where you're at and you say to him, Lord God, transform my life. I don't want to be lukewarm. 
I don't want to be weak regarding these things. Oh, God, give me your salvation. Give me your power. And this grace I heard about today, I don't want to use it as a cloak or as some sort of a Band-Aid. Oh, God, may your grace be the very power that causes me to be transformed. Make me new. Is that your prayer today? You tell him right now, friend, right where you're at. But for all of us as believers, oh, I hope Jesus comes back this week. May we see his return. And if he does come this week, may we be caught happily, beautifully caught, being busy about our Father's business as we live for Christ by the grace of God, as we be the church. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said,